Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, we're on topic 8 right now. You've reached this topic because you clicked on the link that you found in the course notes on Brightspace. Before you proceed, make sure you download those course notes to your device of choice. That way they're always in your possession. You never know when you're going to lose access to those course notes or to Brightspace in general. So download them right now. Uh, let's move on. The topic today is spatial separations, which is under uh, section 3.2.3. .3. And the whole point of this section is to learn about how the building code gives guidelines about the protection of the spread of fire from one building to another one, okay, uh, by giving guidelines on what the exterior of a building must look like. In more detail, like I wrote up here, is that the you're gonna, we're going to learn about the protection against the spread of fire from the exterior wall of one building to the exterior wall of another building. Let me put this in context. Let's pretend that you have, there's a house on fire like this one, okay? And you can see that there, is, there are flames that are coming out of windows or other openings in the house. Well, the whole point of this section is to learn about how to then set up the adjacent buildings like this one so that the spread of fire, the chance of fire jumping from one building to the next one is minimized. Make sense? Okay, let's do it. So what this section will establish, first of all, is going to be the minimum level of protection that is required in the exterior wall of the building under consideration. So we're going to learn how to figure out whether that building has to be the exterior wall has to be of combustible or non-combustible construction, what the minimum fire resistance rating needs to be of that exterior wall, and the type of cladding that's required. Cladding is a fancy and correct engineering term for the skin, uh, exterior skin of the building. Okay. Okay. The other thing we're going to establish with this section is the allowed amount of unprotected openings in that exterior wall of the building. Okay. Uh, and if you don't remember what combustible means, what non-combustible means, what FRR stands for, go back to topics 5 and 7. They're covered in more detail there. Very well, let's get to this. So, uh, the maximum allowed percentage of unprotected openings, so the maximum percentage of an area that is allowed to be unprotected openings for a wall, are covered in one of four tables. Okay, and these are in tables 3.2 2.3.1b or 3.2.3.1c or d or e. You want to be flipping to those right now, right? In fact, you have the building code open in front of you and you're flipping to them right now to find them. In addition, this table 3.2.3.7 also provides the details about the protection that's required of the exterior wall depending on the percentage of area. Now, I know this sounds like a mouthful, don't worry, we're going to cover this together. So make sure that you have the course notes with you, right? They don't have to be printed, electronic is fine, and that the building code is open in front of you right now, okay? Let's do this, let's dive into it. So these four tables are set up as follows, okay? The first one, 3.2.3.1b, it covers only unsprinklered occupancies A, C, D, and F3. Table 3.2.3.1C only covers unsprinklered occupancies E, F1, and F2. Similarly, the D table covers sprinklered occupancies A, B, C, D, and F3, whereas the E table covers sprinklered occupancies E, F1, and F2. Okay? Now, you don't have to learn this by heart because it says so in the title of each one of the tables. Okay? So for example, here in this table here, you can see this is, I picked 3.2.3.1b. And you'll notice how it tells you exactly what occupancies it covers and that it's for uh, unsprinklered. Okay? So it's not like you have to learn by heart what each, each one of these covers. I want to take you on a bit of a tour of this table because all four of these tables are set up the same way. So first of all, along the top here, you'll find limiting distances. They're in meters and they go from zero all the way to very large numbers. Okay? 
This distance is always in meters. Okay? And next, we're going to find uh, what limiting distances mean. So if I were looking for, say, the definition for limiting distances, where would I find it in the building code? Hmm. So limiting distances refers to the distance in meters according to three possibilities. Possibility one is from the exposing building face under consideration to the nearest property line that that face is uh, exposed to. Two from that exposing building face to the center of the nearest street. Right, not to the edge of the street, the center of the street. Three, from the exposing building face to an imaginary line between this building and the one adjacent to it. Okay? So these are the three ways to establish limiting distances for a face of a building. And again, where did I get this from? You're right. I got it from the location in the building code that contains all the definitions. By now, you know where those are. So here, graphically, I'm trying to illustrate those three different types of limiting distances. So here, you'll see we're limiting distance number one. Examples of that, right? So it's from the building face to the uh, property line. And again, this sketch is provided for you in your course notes. Then number two, remember which one this was? It was to the exposed building face to the center of the nearest street. And the final one, number three, it's from the exposed building face to an imaginary line uh, between that building and the neighboring one. Okay. So I just wanted to make you aware of the different types of limiting distances and what they refer to. They're basically a distance, the minimum distance, from that exposed building face of that building to a specific line depending on the side of the building. Very well. So limiting distance, the way it's set up is it goes from zero, so that means that basically uh, whatever is related to that zero column of limiting distance, uh, it assumes that the building is essentially attached to another building, right? Here's the important thing, which is important for you to write down. You can write this down in pencil in your building code. Wherever you find in the four tables this header along the top that says limiting distance in meters, write next to it in pencil round down. We're going to learn how to calculate limiting distances, and we won't always come up with numbers that match the ones that are along the top, right? So I see 0, 1.2, 1.5, 2, 2.5. We may come up with a number that is somewhere between 2.5 and 3 meters. Which one do we take? Always round down. Because we always want the minimum limiting distance and we want to be conservative. Okay? That will save you. Don't trust me. Okay. So the next thing that we'll look at, okay, we looked at what the top is. On the left-hand side, you have two columns which relate to the building face itself, okay? And the left portion of that left column is the maximum area of that face in square meters, right? So it's the face, the area of that face. And the right column of that left column is the ratio L over H or H over L. And there is less than 3 to 1, 3 to 1 to 10 to 1, and over 10 to 1. What does that mean? How do we use it? Trust me, we'll do it together, okay? So here is an example of, uh, I think I provided this sketch for you in your course notes. Yes, I did. And uh, what we have here is a building. It's the face of a building, okay? So it's the vertical face of a building. And we're being asked to calculate the area of this exposed face, as well as the ratio L over H or H over L. So first of all, let's do the area of this face, okay? This face has a height and it has a width or a length. So the height is always taken from average ground level all the way to the underside of the highest ceiling. Let me repeat that because it's important, okay? You can see on the screen exactly what I'm pointing to. Average ground level all the way to the highest ceiling. Notice how it's not saying to the top of the roof or to the top of the building. It's to the highest ceiling. 
And that's because the highest ceiling is the top of the occupancy, right? On top of the ceiling, there's not going to be anything that has the potential of causing a fire. It's only belief beneath the highest ceiling all the way down that you have people or sources of cause of fire, okay? So in this case, the height is 9.2 meters or 9,200 millimeters as shown here. That's the height, H. How about the length, L? The length L is relatively easy, right? It's the longest width horizontal dimension, right? And so it goes to the outside most walls for that dimension, okay? So then, how do we calculate the area for this? Does it make sense we just do L times H, right? Okay, how about H over L or L over H? Uh, which one do we pick of the two, right? Because the table uses both. It says H over L or L over H. The answer is relatively simple. You want to calculate both. You want to calculate H over L and L over H and take the highest of the two values. So you'll see then on the answer that I provided for you on the screen, the area is calculated by doing 9.2 meters times 12 meters. Right? I did it all in meters because the table is in meters which gives 110.40 meters squared. And then the ratio, I calculated both, and the largest one was L over H, which came out to be 1.3. Or in this case, it's read as 1.3 to 1. Okay? So what you would do then is in the table, you would go find the closest area larger. So in this case, the closest area in that table, which you have open in front of you in the building code, the closest one to 110.4 is 150 meters squared. Okay? And then when you look at L over H and H over L, you have three rows of that. You would pick the row that says less than 3 to 1. Okay? Very well. Now there's another way also to do this, which I'm just going to put up here just for you to show, but we won't do it. Okay? You can also calculate and use this table to so figure out the areas based on whether or not the building has fire compartments within it. Okay? So then the area and the H over L and L over H are only for that fire compartment. So that's a portion of the building itself that is completely sealed all around it. Walls, ceilings, uh, floors, that kind of thing. But we won't touch it. I just want you to be aware that you can do this. Okay? All right, so we looked at what the top is, limiting distance. We looked at what the left-hand side is, which is area and ratio. What's the rest of the table itself? Well, that is basically the percentage of area that may be unprotected. So the portion that I have here for you showing on the screen is actually what we're looking for. Out of the area of that face, what percentage of it is allowed to be unprotected? So all of those numbers inside the table, just like it tells you right here on the table, are percentages of that area that's allowed to be unprotected. And it can go all the way from 0 to 100 percent. 0 means that 0 percent of that face is allowed to be unprotected. Basically, solid wall exterior. 100 means that 100% of that wall, the exterior wall, is allowed to be unprotected. So it could be one giant open window, if you want, or like uh, something like that. Okay? All right. The idea behind using this table, ultimately, is basically similar to the way that you play Battleship. I don't know if many of you had the, the privilege of playing this game. This is the old-fashioned version of it that you play actually by hand, in person. But you, there's a number of these games these versions that you can play online as well. But this is basically how we're going to play it. We're going to play it by figuring out the coordinates along the top for limiting distance and then the coordinates along the side for area and uh, uh, ratio and then wherever the two meet that's going to give us the percentage unprotected area. Okay? Now you don't have to guess how to do it. We'll do it together. But I'm thinking Ah, I'm going to show you examples of two opposites, okay? What I have here are two examples of buildings that I've plucked out of the internet. I've even included the addresses if you're interested. The one on the left, I think you might be familiar with. It's actually a building in Ottawa. Do you see how that building is set up? 
that is the art gallery okay and it's uh, it's that building that has the giant spider outside of it notice how that whole building is basically glass the exterior of the building except for portions of it that are structural okay so that's very close to being a hundred percent unprotected exterior which makes you think whoa uh, what happens to the buildings nearby if there's a fire that comes out of it? Well, go check it out, maybe on Google Earth, right? Because you might not be able to go there in person with COVID and all that. Um, are there any buildings nearby? Or another way to say it is, how close is the closest building to this building? Okay, because essentially the exterior of this building is 100% unprotected. Look at the building on the right. This one is in New York, New York. Okay. Do you see how the exterior wall of this building is essentially a hundred percent just wall, not a single window? You can see there's a little bit of openings down here, and a little bit of openings up here, and those are for ventilation purposes. That is ensuring that enough air gets in and out so that the people inside don't suffocate. But there's not a single window in place. Go check out the Wikipedia page for this building to find out actually what it was used for. Why would you build a building with no windows? But you can see how if the fire broke out of this building it would have a hard time jumping to another one because there are really no openings in the walls, right? Okay, so let's talk about the steps that are going to be required to figure out this value, this maximum exposed area, and then we'll pause this video and in the next video, part two, we'll actually do some examples. These are the steps. Now, I'm not even going to read them because I listed these steps for you in your course notes. You don't have to learn them by heart because I'll never test you on the steps because you'll learn how to do it by practicing. That's where your homework comes into play. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pause here. Example number one is going to be what we're going to start with with part two of the video. Thank you for your time and see you in part two.